Welcome, um, in the name of Radbau Reflex, I welcome you on this evening on climate change. And the title says, how to change climate change. I would rather put a central question, how can we keep our planet into a safe living space? Uh, we'll see how two experts, um, briefly, because we don't have all the time, we would like to have a discussion with you guys, uh, give their view on this central question. And uh, myself, I am Bram Bregman. I have a part-time chair here on climate change, science, policy interaction at Radboud University. I'm director of Radboud Innovation. And I have, uh, um, because of the Netherlands, uh, national focal point of the IPCC of the fifth assessment report. Um, so I have uh, quite some experience with the IPCC reports, uh, good and bad experiences. Um, and... Um, I would like to introduce two uh, speakers, two uh, important speakers. One is, I'm very happy to introduce Stephen Pakala. Stephen Pakala is professor of ecology and environmental biology of Princeton University. He is director of the Princeton Environmental Institute. He is um, very active in the interaction between climate change, ecosystems, biosphere, uh, interactions, uh, and he is very active because he is also uh, a well-known or uh, a welcome person in the White House or in the Congress, or he, he is uh, very active also in trying to influence uh, the public policy on climate change. He's the co-founder of Climate Central. You should, if you don't know it, Google it uh, from when I was at the KNMI, the Dutch Met Office, we worked a lot with, uh, with Climate Central. Uh, uh, climate change attribution stuff. They, these guys are very good in, in making the stuff available for a bigger audience. And that is something that we also do tonight uh, for the subject. Uh, and last but not least, he will get an honorary doctorate uh, uh, in two days from now, uh, during the DS. So I'm very happy and very honored to have him here, uh, and he will give a talk. Now, I would also like to introduce Helene de Koning, and you might have uh, noticed her in the media quite a lot the recent week. And many of you probably have known or seen or experienced that there has been a new IPCC report on the 1.5 degree uh, global warming possibilities. She was one of the two Dutch main authors of this report, and one of the most important uh, chapters on the solutions, how to mitigate greenhouse gases, was on her responsibility. Great job that she did, it was an excellent job. Eventually the report was approved, and I can tell you this is not something that you do very easily. Um, what will be the program of this evening? We will have a brief lecture by Helene Koning on this report that just appeared. Uh, there is room for questions. If you have a very burning question, we would like to have an interaction with you. So uh, please raise your hand. Uh, we could also we also give room after the uh, presentation for you to ask questions. And then we will have the lecture by Stephen Pekala, also about 15 minutes, and then we will have a, a discussion on some of the burning questions you obviously will have after or already now uh, the presentations. Um, I wish everybody a very enjoyable evening, and I would like to invite Helene to come over. Right, thank you very much. My slides, yeah. So this is also a very exciting moment for me, because this is the first time I'll present uh, the IPCC Special Report on Global Warming of 1.5c which has been uh, a big part of my life in the past uh, year and a half. Um, it costs a lot of time and, uh, and especially in the past few weeks, a lot of effort as well to, uh, to get it approved. And what I'll try to do is give you a taste of one, some of the main results uh, of the report. Maybe to start with um, on the IPCC as such, because many people think it's an organization that uh, basically prescribes policies, that tells policymakers what to do. Or if the IPCC comes out with a report on 1.5c, people think, oh, it's great, the world has decided that we will stay below 1.5c. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case. The IPCC is a scientific panel uh, run by the United Nations. It provides 
Uh, it assesses the literature around climate change, the peer-reviewed literature around climate change, in order to inform policymakers so that they can make better decisions, essentially. Uh, our mantra as authors in the IPCC report is policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive. So we cannot tell any policymakers what they should do. What we can say is things like, if you want to remain below 1.5 C, you will have to, etc., etc. That's the, those kind of conditional statements we can do, but we cannot say you should do this or it is better to do this than that. That would be advocative and that would be the end of the IPCC, essentially. I also sometimes get asked, uh, are you still free as a scientist to write what you want? In the IPCC, aren't you governed by politicians in this process? And there's a yes and a no answer to that. Uh, the way it works is that the IPCC is essentially a meeting of governments. They decide which reports will be written, and they decide on the outline of those reports. So the main chapters and some bullet points about what should be in the, in the chapters. That they hand over to the authors. The authors start working with that, make a new outline, um, assess the literature, write a first draft. Uh, this is being reviewed by a lot of people, uh, first only by experts, and in a second round also by, by governments. Um, and eventually we come up with a final version of the report, taking hopefully into account many of the comments, because those comments are really good. Usually they really improve the report, and then eventually we end up uh, with, a, with a final report, which is really authored by the author, so it's our domain as scientists. Now, in addition to that, and that's, I think the beauty of the IPCC, there is sort of a political process. The, um, those same governments that have approved the out outline also approve a summary for policymakers. And we as authors write the first draft of that. This goes into his approval meeting. And for five or six days and nights, governments are negotiating about what should be in that summary and precisely how it should be formulated. And we as authors are there in order to make sure that the summary does not contradict the underlying report. So we are sort of the gatekeepers of, of the science there. And I can tell you sometimes that's tough, because sometimes there's a lot of pressure from governments to sort of change something. Uh, but we just cannot uh, contradict the underlying report. So that's sort of how it works. And this approval session of five, six days happened in Korea in the first week of October. And then the Monday after that, uh, the report was released and, uh, and you could all read about it in the newspapers. So that's how IPCC works. So it's not, so this is uh, uh, the background to this report. This report is a little bit special because normally the IPCC decides itself to write a report as governments. In this case, the governments that have signed up to the Paris Agreement asked sp specifically for this report. So the Paris Agreement is, uh, was from December 2015 said we could, should stay well below two degrees temperature rise globally and strive for one and a half degrees. And this strive for was a difficult thing. Lots of countries wanted it, but they weren't sure whether it was possible. Uh, so they wanted to ask the scientists, can you tell us something about what the consequences are of limiting it to 1.5 compared to two degrees, and also whether it's still uh, within the realm of possibilities and what we should do for it. So that is the background to this report, and that actually makes it a little bit more political than other IPCC reports, because it will be used directly in the climate negotiations, which will happen in December this year in Katowice, in, in Poland. Okay, so this particular report was written by 91 authors from 40 countries, uh, another 133 contributing authors. Um, we assessed 6,000 literature sources, and um, um, a bit proud to say that uh, half of those were in the chapter uh, that I was uh, a coordinating lead author for. We had more than 1,100 uh, reviewers and uh, 42,001 comments. <laughs> And who made that one comment? <laughs> um, and we have to address all those comments that's in these two review rounds. We have to address them one by one. And these responses and the comments will be public. So we have to do a good job. So in itself, you know, responding to that many comments with you know, 90 authors or so was a, a big job. OK, so what are the key messages? Um, first of all, we are already at one degree warming. The world has already warmed by one degree centigrade, and this is due to humans, and we are already seeing the consequences on people, on livelihoods, and on ecosystems. 
if we go on like this, uh, we will reach one and a half degrees on average globally uh, between 2030 and 2050, roughly. Um, there are very clear benefits to limiting warming to one and a half degrees compared to two. Uh, we can still do it, geophysically speaking, but we need to change a lot in order to make it happen. Um, and finally, this report, and I won't go into it in the presentation, but it's good to keep that in mind, also made an assessment of how the uh, one and a half degree targets and its measures interact with the sustainable development goals, which are much broader than just climate change, and basically concluded that the interaction is generally positive. So limiting warming to 1.5 C has positive interactions with other environmental and social goals. So going more into detail, um, what does it mean to limit warming to 2 degrees compared to 1.5 degrees? Um, first of all, less extreme weather events, especially where people live, including extreme heat and, and rainfall, so basically less cost on that. Very concretely, by 2100, global mean sea level rise will be 10 centimeters less under a one and a half degree scenario compared to a two degree scenario, which corresponds at the current population with 10 million people uh, that are fewer that are exposed to risk of, of rising seas and would potentially have to migrate. Now, sea level rise continues after 2100. It's not something that you prevent uh, with a one and a half degree scenario. It will, will continue, but it will continue at a lower level than with, uh, with two degrees. And it will go more slowly, which allows uh, adaptation to it, uh, um, that, that's more realistic. Coral reefs would pretty much completely disappear under a two degree scenario and under a one and a half degree scenario we'd still have 10-20% left. And we'd have an ice-free North Pole every 100 versus every 10 years in a one and a half versus two scenario. This is just a selection of the impacts the, the difference in impacts. And this report, one of, I think one of the merits of this report, it's not my chapter, but it's one of the merits, is that it really brought a lot of literature together that assesses this and that really shows that there is a big difference in this half degree average temperature rise. Now, what do we need to do in order to stay below 1.5 C in terms of our emission pathways? So how do we need to, as a world, develop? And it's also important to say that all these numbers are global numbers. The IPCC in this report did not look at regional uh, development, also not for, for emission uh, pathways. We need to have CO2 emissions fall by about 45% globally by 2030 compared to 2010. For two degrees, that would be only 20%. Still challenging, but it's really a, a very different uh, scenario. Um, in terms of net zero emissions, so when do we have to have net zero CO2 emissions? That's basically the, the difference between the CO2 emissions you still have left and some carbon dioxide removal, so actively removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, that would mean around 2050 in order to have a good chance of, uh, of limiting warming to 1.5 C. And for two degrees that would be more like 2075, uh, so a couple of decades later. And also, uh, there's actually, between the scenarios that these, this report looked at, there's not a big difference between the non-CO2 emissions, because in the sort of pathways uh, that the researchers looked at and that are generally modeled, the non-CO2 emissions like methane or uh, nitrous oxide or black carbon were already m maximally reduced anyway. So in that sense, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference whether you're doing a one and a half or a two degree scenario, it's essentially the same outcome. So the big difference is in, in how, how we deal with CO2. Um, so this is just a picture to show, uh, um, just very in very simple terms, the temperature development um, since 1960, and you see how the line is going up, obviously. Um, the dashed arrow shows where we would sort of, with a huge uncertainty range, because it's, it's fairly uncertain how the, the Earth responds, um, uh, when we would uh, uh, reach this one and a half degree um, limit. And you can also see that some of the scenarios that we're looking at actually have an overshoot over one and a half degree and then return back to one and a half degrees at the end of the century. So by 20, the criterion is by 2100, we have to be below 1.5 C. That means that in the meantime, we can go over a little bit. Um, however, there are some sort of irreversible 
impacts, which you would get if you would reach like 1.7c and then get back down, you, haven't, uh, you can't go back on some of these impacts. For instance, extinction of species. Um, all these scenarios are assigned a sort of a, a likelihood. And the uh, one and a half degree scenarios, it's generally a likelihood of 50, 66 or, or a bit higher percent that you will stay below 1.5c. So it's not a guarantee. If you want a guarantee, you probably need to reduce emissions right away. So that's just to, to characterize that. If we then look into the future in terms of how we would reduce emissions, and this has the uh, billion tons of CO2 emissions uh, per year on the y-axis and, and time on the, uh, the x-axis, uh, in the big graph at least, um, you see that for the, the two degree scenarios are sort of the, the, the gray um, um, part. No, I'm wrong about that. No, sorry. Um, the two degree scenarios are not there. The, uh, the gray ones are pathways with high overshoots and the blue ones with a no or limited overshoot. And that means not higher than 1.5 C centigrade. You have to draw a line somewhere. And you can see that the, the high overshoot scenarios basically continue emitting CO2 for longer and then have a sharper decline. And the other ones uh, are going down earlier and, uh, and basically get negative uh, uh, also, yeah, somewhere between 2030 and, uh, and 2050 or so for most of them. There are a couple of tens of scenarios that have been assessed here. So you see a lot of these, these lines that do that. Um, we uh, also looked at four illustrative ones just to show people, like, what does it mean to look at one of those scenarios? Um, and I'll show you one of those in a minute. But first, um, what would need to change? in order to stay on those emission pathways, because, of course, they're very abstract pathways, right? They're just calculations. Basically, what it means is, is systemic transitions in a number of fields and carbon dioxide removal. And uh, in the report, we identify four systemic transitions. One is the energy transition. Another one is the land and ecosystem transition, everything related to forestation, uh, agriculture. Um, the urban and infrastructure system transition, what happens with what we build in our cities. Uh, and finally, the industrial system transition, so what, is, what happens in how do we make things. And then the final one is this carbon dioxide removal, which uh, I'm sure Steve will talk more about as well. And within those transitions, you have a number of options, adaptation and mitigation options that would have to happen under a one and a half degree scenario. Um, and it would have to happen very fast. And what we try to do in, in my chapter is look at, not just at what those pathways are saying, which are big complicated models that optimize on, basically on costs, but we also look at how feasible are these individual options. And what can we say about how feasible these transitions actually are? Now, if you look at some of these uh, illustrative pathways, it's just one of those uh, little spaghetti lines. Um, there's four that we present in the summary for policymakers. And one, the one on the left here, P1, um, is, is a scenario that is very heavy on behavioral change. So it basically reduces energy demand, particularly very fast. They made very ambitious assumptions on that. Um, this means that actually by the end of the century, you don't need that much in terms of negative emissions. So you don't need to reduce that much CO2 from the atmosphere as in other uh, cases. And you could probably just do it with afforestation. You don't need to put it underground in geological storage reservoirs and combine it with a lot of bioenergy. Um, there's another, a, a few other scenarios. An example is this one, P3, which is a scenario which, which basically follows historical trends. Um, then starts, uh, um, there's innovation happening. Uh, these emission reductions are really mainly achieved by how we're making energy and, and products. And you see quite a lot of negative emissions at the end, and it's mainly done by this technology of bioenergy and uh, carbon capture and geological storage. So basically, your, a lot of your energy would be generated by biomass in combination with capturing the CO2 in a chemical factory and storing it in the deep underground. Um, so those are just the, the, the idea is, and then there's a more extreme scenario even that, that allows us to continue longer on our current path, but then you have to decline your emissions very rapidly, and you have to end up with about 20 gigatons of CO2 in terms of negative, net negative emissions. And uh, if you remember, the current CO2 emissions are about 42 gigatons of CO2, so that's a lot of 
storage that you would have to do in order to make that scenario happen and stay below 1.5C. The point here was that we sort of give the policymakers who are reading this something to choose from, right? So you don't need to do this 20 gigatons of CO2 if you act on other fields before that, right? There's um, what we did then as well is look at the feasibility of these options in these different system transitions along uh, six different dimensions, technological, economical, social, institutional, etc. And if you put that basically with these four scenarios, uh, I just took a few examples, for instance, we um, see if this we look at, for instance, solar PV, which is a big one in any scenario. There's a lot of studies on that, so we had a high confidence level. Economically, it's looking more favorable, technological as well, institutional, sometimes there, there are barriers, and geophysical, it really depends on where you are, uh, how, how feasible it is. Um, other options, like this is this bioenergy and CCS. We're actually not assigning a very high feasibility on that because of land use issues that are very, very prominent for that. So that this sort of qualifies what the models are saying. It's basically saying the models are assuming no public resistance uh, and, and no, no issues in the institutional side, we're saying, well, you know, that's, there's, there's issues there that need to be resolved. Okay, if you, so you suppose you could do all these system transitions. Um, you, you don't get them just like that, right? You need to make them happen and you have to do that actively. And we identify six critical enabling conditions. And a very important one is finance, and that's not just giving grants to researchers. It means uh, adding, um, or adding like 14% or so by 2035 to the complete investments in the world and directing that to energy, and particularly renewable energy and energy efficiency. And that will correspond to a huge reduction of investments in the high carbon options. So this is a, a big change in, in how we invest in, in, in our future infrastructure. Um, it's not, the, the numbers are not crazy. They're sort of within the realm of possibility, but it is a, a big shift. And of course, not everybody's happy with that shift. Others are import, uh, also important policy. Obviously, a carbon price is one of it, but it's never going to be enough. Um, De-risking these investments is, is very important. And actually, one of the things I took courage from last week was the decision by the, the Dutch bank, the Nederlands Bank, to uh, um, add a climate stress test for investments and to start investigating that. Because if a financial regulator like that changes the game for investments, then you really can start moving, right? It's not the public purse anymore that's financing it. It's actually the conditions under which you invest that you, you are changing. Institutional capacity, I think, is often underestimated. We think that, like everything just works and as soon as we have a solution, we know how to do it. It's not true. It's not true here in the Netherlands and it's certainly not true in, uh, in countries in Africa where capacity in general is just very low. We need to work together with all kinds of different actors, so governance is important. Um, behavior change is one of the things that was, for, for the first time maybe in IPCC uh, reports, assessed uh, at quite some length in, in the report, actually by the other Dutch author, Professor Linda Stech from Groningen. Um, and she also said it's not just behavioral change and how, what we do with our lifestyles, it's also how do you create public support for the sort of strong policies that you need in order to make this happen. And finally, last but not least, uh, technological innovation. We need these technologies to, uh, uh, to come to the fore. A few personal thoughts, maybe not as an IPCC author, but as, uh, as, as me. I think there are hopeful signs in the cost reductions in renewables, in uh, some developments in behavioral change. I, I take courage from that, that it is maybe still possible. Um, at the same time, I'm not stupid, you know. You see all around the world that countries are investing, even still in coal-fired power, even when the cost price of alternatives are actually very close. And that is just because they know how to do coal-fired power, and it, it's turnkey technology, it's large-scale, and that's what those countries often need. It's often developing countries with a shortage in their electricity markets. So there's still a lot of investments in high-carbon infrastructure, and those will lock us in for decades, and that is very worrying. And I think that's also where international cooperation has to come in. Um, because 
here we have the means and the technologies to change things also there. But it has to be in collaboration. It can't just be a transfer of money and, uh, and a transfer of capacities. And maybe even the current you know, criticism on international trade helps a little bit. Um, because you will see that countries might actually um, withdraw a little bit in, into their own territories and, uh, and, and uh, there's actually a reduction in this, uh, this interaction, maybe. So I think this report is a hopeful warning. And uh, the beauty about the IPCC is that all these governments have agreed to this summary. Right? So they take home the messages and that makes it different from any other scientific report. Which, I mean, we could have put the same authors in a room, they would have produced the same report, but it would not have the same significance if it had not been an IPCC report. So let's hope they take note. And uh, I really like this headline uh, of the, uh, <laughs> the BBC. <laughs> um, and I thank you for your attention. We're going to switch gears a little bit uh, for the United States. Um, situation and Stephen will also have a very, I think, also a, a, a positive, a, a very inspiring uh, examples of how we can deal with climate change in the technological development, right? Being from the, the United States, um, one is happy with a very low bar to hurdle these days. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. All right. So, so I call this climate change paradox in the USA, hope in dark and warming times. The dark and warming speak for themselves. Um, the, the Paris Agreement, as you know, uh, Article 2 said that uh, all the signatories were going to reduce emissions so that we avoided two degrees, substantially less than two degrees, with an aspiration for one and a half degrees. Um, and also that sources equal sinks, that is zero net emissions by around mid-century. Now, when Obama was the previous US president was in office, he had a set of policies around that were frankly just the beginning, all right? They got going a little bit. They cut emissions by uh, about a half a gigaton from power generation in 2030, and by a bunch of rules, mostly changes in automotive mileage standards um, by, by 2030 also, and reduced emissions by about a gigaton. But they also had, for the first time, a 2050 goal, which while not enough to get to substantially less than two degrees, was still pretty substantive, an 80% emissions reduction by mid-century. This is aspirational, but, but uh, at least it's, um, it, it passes the laugh test. Now, when, when you're an American these days traveling abroad, uh, in addition to feeling sort of shame and wanting to skulk around and hide, um, you're also, whenever I talk to an audience like this, there is an elephant in the room, all right, with us. And that elephant <laughs> is obvious, okay? And since Donald Trump was elected, he has attempted in what are, I think, there would be you know, nearly unanimous consensus globally is the single most irresponsible set of environmental policies in the world now, announced a withdrawal from Paris by the second largest emitter and the largest historic emitter of CO2, all right? The country more responsible than any other uh, for this problem. And he's attempted to scrap the Obama uh, initiatives to reduce emissions from power and the transport sector. These actions have taken up more than half of my time since his election, and I have a full-time day job, okay? Now, with that said, it's important to understand that these are all announcements, it's announced and attempted. None of it has happened yet. The withdrawal from Paris can't legally happen until after the next presidential election, okay? All of the big scrappings of the Obama initiatives are subject to court challenges that are winding their way through the court with very strong precedents on the other side. So these are not yet done. There's just a lot of, the Germans would say, Sturm und Drang around this, right? Just a lot of noise. So I wanna talk about, in the, with this as a backdrop, about two reasons for optimism. And there are a couple here. The first one has to do with a revolution in low carbon technology. This is not usually chronicled, but one of the singular 
accomplishments of humanity has taken place in the last 15 years. And I want everybody to be aware that this is the case. Many of you know it, but oftentimes it happens so slowly that you're not really aware that what happened was extraordinary. And the second one, I'm labeling the wisdom of the marketplace. And I'm going to let that stand by itself. We'll get back to it in a minute. It's a reference to Keynes. Okay, so, so this is a personal uh, a way of telling the story for me. But 14 years ago, a guy named Rob Sokolow and I published a paper in the journal Science, which was an attempt to, it actually had an audience of one. Um, the, 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 the US is, even without Trump, the only major country in the world where one of the main political parties has, as part of its platform, active denial of climate science, okay? This must change, and that's what the second part of the of the talk's gonna be about. And at the time, um, the party was actually a little bit ahead of where it is now, uh, but, tr uh, but, but Bush the Younger's uh, m Minister of, of, uh, of uh, Energy, his Department of Energy head, had a, had a speech he liked to give that we lacked the technology even to get started. He liked to say we need a, an invention as sort of fundamental as the discovery of the use of electricity by Faraday in the 19th century to get started. And so Sokol and I wrote this paper to, to, to make it impossible for him to give that speech. And I saw him afterwards, and he said, you wrecked my speech. It actually worked, OK? And so, so the idea was this. Um, we were here in 2004. These were global emissions. This is in billions of tons of carbon atoms, not billions of tons of CO2, which is the way we did it back then. Uh, the world was at seven of these units. And we just linearly extrapolated the trend 50 years into the future, which is sort of the lifetime of a career or a power plant, and said, that's where we're going to go under business as usual, a doubling. And we just said, well, what's it mean to get started? And we said, well, let's suppose we freeze emissions for 50 years. It was just that simple-minded. And to freeze emissions for 50 years and then drop them afterwards, which would take you to roughly two and a half to three degrees, much less stringent than the... The, the targets we've subsequently adopted, you needed to cut this green triangle out of future emissions. And that green triangle rose from zero averted emissions in 2004 to 7 billion metric tons of carbon atoms of averted emissions 50 years later. And we said, well, OK, let's divide that thing into seven equal wedges, each one growing from zero averted emissions in 2004 to 1 billion metric tons of averted emissions in, in 2054, 50 years later. And we asked, are there any technologies in the marketplace even big enough to do one of these seven wedges? Do we have anything that we can get started with? And so we inventoried the technologies, and we came up with 14 already in the marketplace at an industrial scale that could be scaled up to do one of these things. And the message was, not only do we have enough to get started, we've got a super abundance. We can have markets choose which one um, uh, 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 is the most uh, um, uh, is, is the most cost effective. So the point I want to make, when I reiterate, we only got we're getting started, and the reason we didn't talk about endgame is that we lacked technologies to complete the problem. We lacked a way to build a zero-emitting energy system to actually finish the carbon problem. All we were doing is getting started. And that was a big innovation at the time because the technology was so limited. Sokolow likes to like, liken it to a horse race at the beginning. We had 14 technologies. All of them here at the beginning of a US horse race called the Kentucky Derby were at the same place. And here we are now, just 14 years later, and we're at the end of the back stretch. All right? One more turn to go, and then it's a sprint to the finish. And where are we? Well, wind and solar have raced ahead beyond anybody's wildest expectations. The most precipitous drop of a major technology in history, they're now the cheapest forms of energy. In the right place, they're down to one, point, one and three quarters cents per kilowatt hour for new builds. All right? New coal is five cents a kilowatt hour. This is far, far cheaper. Offshore wind now with 10 megawatt turbines can be built for six cents a kilowatt hour, which is roughly the same as new gas. This is a spectacular achievement. We thought that hydrogen would be the big winner at the time. 
and it's really fallen off. There is some talk now about hydrogen for fuel, but the cost of hydrogen and that sort of thing haven't really developed that much. Nuclear also, a lot of nuclear disasters, not much nuclear build. End use efficiency, some stuff happened, LED light bulbs. Gas, we had a gas for coal wedge. Gas emits half the emissions per unit of electricity compared to coal, but the gas supply was uncertain. We didn't know how much gas we had. Gas was expensive, that sort of thing. And since that time, hydrofracking and horizontal drilling made gas super abundant. There is now well over a century's worth of supply here. And it's the cheapest form of fossil by a long shot. Batteries came out of cell phones and jumped into cars, so much so that it's now possible to, to consider. In fact, the major car companies have announced an end to, to petrol-powered cars because batteries have come so far so quickly. And finally, I have carbon capture and geologic storage. Hasn't been the same success story, but at the time there was really only one project. All right, Didn't know how well it would work in that sort of thing. And now, routinely, even within the coterminous lower 48 U.S. states, we inject 31 million tons a year and it's growing at over 10% per year. So what's interesting about this is that if you ask, how do you build a non-emitting energy system? Everybody starts with wind and solar. Everybody starts with, well, it's got to be almost all electricity, moving transport to electricity as much as possible. And, and then the problem is the intermittency. What happens when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine? Okay, so you need a way to back up that intermittency. And there are basically three ways to do it. You can do it with batteries, but we don't have the right kind of batteries. And moreover, there are a lot of reasons to believe that, well, we may be able to deal with day-night fluctuations, 10-day doldrums in the wind or dark periods, very unlikely. We could do it with hydrogen from renewable electricity and store the hydrogen and burn it in turbines to do more electricity, but that's 50% loss of energy when you do that round trip. It's unlikely to improve, very expensive. The most cost-effective way to do it is controversial in some environmental circles, but it's gas with CCS, gas with carbon capture and storage. So right now, we could build a system with wind and solar electricity, gas with CCS backing it up, the electricity would cost about what it costs today, and the system would emit nothing. And we could run most of our transport with batteries, and then we've got a little bit more to do. So in just 14 years, we went from not having anything available to end game to an end game as cheap as our electricity system today. There is no comparable 14-year period in the last 100 years. This is a spectacular accomplishment of humanity, and it is the brightest spot in the global warming story. We lacked the technology just 14 years ago, and now we have the way to finish this thing if we want to just swap out our kit for something else right now. Okay, so, and that says that. That's the technological endgame, which is now humanity has given itself as a present, okay? Now, another reason for optimism, I want to switch to the wisdom of the marketplace. This is a very U.S. story. So here's the technological endgame I was talking about. And to make this happen in the U.S., a believer in the power of markets would put a price on carbon. It's the European way of doing things. It's the economist way of doing things. Put a price on carbon and let markets set, settle it out. There is a movement within our conservative party, the climate-denying Republican Party. Here are young Republicans debating a carbon tax, right? So put a price on carbon. That's the conservative market-friendly way to do this sort of thing. A believer in command and control who said, look, governments can pick winners, would subsidize with direct subsidies or tasks tax breaks, the swapping of the emitting kit for the non-emitting kit. They'd subsidize wind and solar, electric car purchases, and carbon capture and storage. And indeed, Obama did some of that. He had large subsidies relative to their costs on solar and wind and electric car purchases, but he had no CCS subsidy, so it wasn't a complete package at all. So Obama got out, and you would expect the Republicans, the climate-denying Republicans, to get rid of all this subsidy stuff for something they don't believe. But what did they do? Well, in the tax bill of December 2017, hidden in a provision was a continuation of these Obama-era subsidies. 
And then in February in 2018, they published a bizarre thing called Section 45Q in a bill known as the Freedom Act, buried in there, which subsidized CCS at $50 a ton. What's the current European price on carbon? 19 euros, so it's 50 bucks. So already, all, but what they've done is subsidized all elements of this technological endgame. That's just one piece of a very interesting story, could tell you many other elements of it that indicate that at least big elements in that party, including the Secretary of Energy, are trying to figure out how to formulate a policy which is different from what they've had before. So how did this get through the current Congress, which is really dominated a lot by some crazy people? And the answer is, I did forensic work on it. I do enough work with uh, the US House and Senate to actually find out who voted for what and why. Very interesting story. And it's because it's highly heterogeneous. The oil and gas interests were lobbied by oil and gas companies who wanted these subsidies. Wind manufacturers were lobbied by were lobbied their senator, like the powerful Senator Rob Portman from Ohio, who, who was protecting his turbine, turbine uh, manufacturing. All the environmental NGOs teamed up with the oil companies and the American Petroleum Institute to, to lobby for this. Everybody was lobbying from every direction for this thing. Very much like the power of the marketplace. The marketplace collectively had decided this technological transition has happened. And the market then in its wisdom, has expressed its wisdom and its decision through heterogeneous, uncoordinated lobbying from all directions. And I actually believe that's the most likely hypothesis. I think Keynes was right here, and this is the way the market is expressing itself. So, there's a, what passes for a philosopher in the United States is a baseball player. The guy's name is Yogi Berra, and he was a sage that lived and played just after World War II. And he said all kinds of things. The future ain't what it used to be. <laughs> he said it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> and the one that's most appropriate here, he said it ain't over till it's over. And that's what I want to leave you with. So these are actually two quite different stories on the same thing, but they come together, but from a different framing. And uh, it is interesting to see that from uh, Helene, from your side, um, you're really focused on this 1.5 degree, and your point is actually, whatever it's 1.5 degree or two degrees, we're gonna make our world more sustainable, right? Do you care about, you know, is there any, discussion about how important this is 1.5 or 2 degrees? Is that academic or is it just, you know, don't focus on this 1.5 degree or 2 degrees. Eventually we want to make our world sustainable. So the important thing to know, first of all, is that CO2 in the atmosphere, extra CO2 is dangerous, all right? It's demonstrably dangerous. It kills people and costs hundreds of billions, maybe trillions of dollars now, okay? And so, so extra CO2 in the atmosphere is dangerous, number one. And number two, through time, as the CO2 builds in the atmosphere, the incremental extra damage you get for each bit of CO2 you add, each part per million that you add, is bigger damages you add than the one you added before. So it's an accelerating damage function. And what that means is you should stop as soon as you can. So the question is, how rapidly can we stop and not cast the developing world into poverty, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, not hurt people in other ways because our mm -hmm. energy brings us things that we all love. I flew here for crying out loud, right? And so, and you just flew from <laughs> South <did>. Africa, right? <laughs> so, so the point is that, that, that the argument is how rapidly can we make a technological transition and not cause hardship that's worse than the rapidity of the transition? So everyone, I think, agrees that, that, that thinks about this hard, that we could do it in two and a half degrees or so, right? Two and a half degrees, we all say, yeah, we could probably do that. Maybe two and a half or three. Two is a stretch. One and a half is a stretch. It, it, it's really a stretch. It's feasible but, technologically, but it is a stretch. But let me say this. This, 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 is, now, this is getting interesting. 
<laughs> how, <laughs> how, how, LA, agree. Yeah. LA, how <laughs> academic is a 1.5 degree target? Well, it's a political target. So I think I um, completely agree with Steve. Every additional ton you add to the atmosphere is, is causing damage already. Um, the governments in the Paris Agreement um, could agree on a temperature target well below two degrees, vague enough to agree on something and strive for <coughs> one and a half. The question was asked to the IPCC, could you please explain what that means? If we strive for one and a half, and, and actually it was what I always find interesting about this is that after the latest IPCC report in 2014, the debate was, can we make two degrees? Is it actually feasible? And lots of modelers, the ones who are running those models that are now in the IPCC report said, mm, it's gonna be really hard, it's not realistic. Then the Paris Agreement happened. It said well below two and strive for one and a half. Uh, that was a political compromise, and what uh, did five what minutes did before 12. Uh, what did right? all those scientists do? Suddenly they could mo model, model one and a half degrees. <laughs> Brave scientists. Eh? So, I mean, if, you, if, if, if science is sort of speaking truth to power, right? If science is sort of the basic starting point and, and basically the, the policymakers and the politicians follow what the scientists are, are saying. In this case, uh -uh. It, was, it was really the political agenda um, sort of over spilling over into the, the scientific agenda just, and that, that went through the IPCC essentially. So I think that the temperature target mattered because politicians could agree to it and then from that follows actions that, 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 that are very much similar to, to what Steve said in terms of renewables and in terms of, of CCS and potentially other technologies as well. So, so I can tell you what the American delegation negotiator said about this precise point in the Paris uh, uh, negotiations. And so I don't know if it's universal, but it's what the American team um, uh, uh, thinks was the course of events. So there was a figure that looked at the difference between one and a half to two degrees with sea level rise at sort of millennium time scales. And, it's, and there's a great big jump in this figure at one and a half degrees. Yeah. So and there was two, yeah. lobbying by mostly Pacific Island nations, intensive lobbying to get this, to get this one and a half degrees inserted in the target for that right. reason. At the same time, an organization called Climate Central um, had, had ready a whole bunch of mock-ups of all the world's most famous monuments under the difference between one and a half and two degrees. And they released it that morning. Those got 100 million web hits that day, and, and uh, so I hope we, we made some difference. But in any case, the one and a half degree target came in, as you say, as a political negotiation exactly. in the yeah. 11th hour. Exactly. Isn't the report too political? Is it, you know, do we, don't you let yourself steer too much by politics? Might is, it on, uh, is, it, is it on the, on the expense of the credibility? I mean, we, what, we, what we did is we assessed 6,000 papers. We read more than that because we had to cut. <laughs> yeah. um, it, the literature indicates, it gives a lot of information that we use in, in, in the report. And there's not that many scientists who say it's, it's completely impossible. Right? It's the, because geophysically it's quite clear it's still possible right. at, at some kind of a likelihood. Right. We, we are answering a political question. We're trying to do it as scientifically rigorous as we, uh, as, as we can. We have rules within IPCC that we follow to make sure it is embedded in the, in the science. There's probably things we missed. There's probably things we did wrong. Uh, there's probably things we could have done more. I can think of a few already. But, uh, but this, is, this is what it is. And, and I think actually, I mean, I get asked like, do we, do we, and actually there was a few reports in the media as well, that the IPCC authors are influenced by uh, the oil companies, that they're part of the author team. That's not my perception in the process at all. We, we took all review comments as seriously, and, and I have to say for some options, like, uh, like bioenergy and CCS, for instance, you get basically 400 comments, 200 saying, this, you're advocative <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on CCS, right? You're yeah. way too, uh, and others are saying, Come on, you're, you're treating this as a, um, uh, you're not, not positive enough about it. Actually, we know much more than this. And, uh, and so maybe we're somewhere, we got it right somewhere.